you try to make things happen. Because you can, you have the energy and the strength to try to make things happen. But as you begin to age, things change a little bit. So you don't have maybe the same degree of energy or strength. So you begin to become more interested in the allowing things to happen part of the, of the practice. And to find that part of the practice, what's essential is, is just to really be attentive when you practice, you know, that, you know, Patanjali suggests it's uh, like 50% trying to make it happen, but the other 50% allowing it to happen. And in early stages of practice, I think that ratio is probably more like about 95% trying to make it happen, and 5% allowing it to happen. So even though with the age, maybe the body gets a little stiffer, maybe a little weaker, maybe a little fatter. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Guruji always remembers you at the peak of your practice. <laughs> So when he would see you subsequently, and uh, you were not quite at the same pinnacle of perfection in your practice, he, he wasn't shy about reminding you. <laughs> you know, I remember traveling to New York to practice with him, um, probably close to 10 years ago. And, uh, you know, I got there, I'm in practice, I'm overjoyed to see him and be with him. And, uh, you know, he's adjusting me in a pose and he says, Oh, team, why? <laughs> <laughs> no practice, you. <laughs> now very stiff, also very fat. <laughs> My guru gave me the snooze. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the good news is that as your practice begins to wane, um, you become less attached to it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, you start to tell people that it's not really that important to you. You know, the one thing, the one thing about practice in all seriousness that can continue to improve over the years is the quality of attention that you bring to it. And I think that's really the most important aspect of the practice. Anyway, so anyway, that's all. Anybody else want to respond to that? Or? Okay. When we would go to Mysore, my daughter and I, Guruji would always say, oh, Vanessa, very good practicing every day, which was not true, and very obviously not true. And he would look at me and say, no practice. <laughs> yeah, it was so amazing. He had his teeth in you know? When I was 58, which is five years ago, I realized that I might not see Guruji in the flesh very much longer. So I asked him that question. So Guruji, I've been practicing very long time now, what should it look like? What is going to happen after 60? What should I be doing? And very quickly, you, one hour asana every day. No more, no less. But one hour, because of my nervous system still needs that kind of strength and, and energy movement through the asana. He left the room and Manju was there and he said, really after 60, you need to take time for the next stage of life. You take chanting, you take the meditation, and you start contemplating more as even though you may be doing these asanas. And my response to him, maybe you should cover your ears. No, no, it's good. I'm sorry, I'm So what I said to Maj is something I could never have said to Guruji. Guruji is that I'm not Hindu. I really find the chanting to Shiva and Krishna and Ganesh very sweet, but it doesn't 
resonated with me. It doesn't change my consciousness because it, I was raised in a Jewish family. So if you mention Jesus or Moses, I'm like, whoa, yes. But Krishna is a very sweet, wonderful image for me, but it doesn't arouse me enough to want me to chant. So Manju said that's why he teaches Gayatri Mantra. And that my job now was to learn to chant the Gayatri Mantra, which is universal truth, which I can relate to. And to learn to chant that and learn to move my energy the same way I move in my asanas, as seated and chanting, or I choose to chant. And for the first time, I was intrigued with chanting because I saw it as a way to something in my life I can actually use in my body and use in my mind. And I am starting to enjoy doing it because it's it's a change and it's certainly more sedentary than my asana practice. But having that focus change from a deity to something more universal has been a long that way. <coughs> someone that feels like they're 60? <laughs> Good, because the question was kind of age specific. But <clears throat> Within the question is an assumption that someone began practicing very young and became 60 and what should they do? So is that saying that anyone 60 shouldn't even begin to practice? Yeah. Right, so there's another side of the story and I think that Rather than saying, how do you adjust the practice when you're 60? I think the answer is the same. If you're 60 or 16 or 40, you adjust the practice to the needs of the individual on that day. And it doesn't matter how old one is. And honestly, what's frightening to me is 60-year-olds are in much better shape today than 14-year-olds. <laughs> so regardless of age, I think when we step on the mat, we just have to deal with the reality of the moment. Because whether you're in your teens or 60s or 70s or 90s, you come to the mat and every day is a little different. And it's the Tommy Joyce is say, minimum daily practice, 3A, 3B, final three closing postures, it's okay. So if we take it like that and start using it as a tool and not a weapon, I think then it's good. I mean, some people wield the shanga like a weapon. There's teachers that just beat their students with the practice. And then there are students that will take the practice and we flog ourselves, right? But either way, the yoga is a tool, like a hammer sitting on a shelf here. I could pick up a hammer and slam it onto my thumbs and say, look how bad hammers are over there in my thumbs. Or I can take the hammer and whack somebody in the head with it, and that person will go, wow, hammers are horrible. Ashtanga yoga has never hurt anyone any more than a hammer has. But if you use the tool improperly, you can get hurt. So it's more of understanding how to utilize the tool and apply the, the use within the context of the reality of the <coughs> situation on any given day. Have to be a little bit flexible with your, your 
definitions of how the poses should look, but it's really the same practice that they can do. And people, you know, at any stage of this process, um, absolutely love it. Um, even if, you know, their Surya Namaskar only involves the arms synchronized with the breath, or drishti, if they can still see, or um, it's still extremely powerful, and it's just what the doctor ordered. And so eventually all of us are going to have to give up the traditional series. Sorry. <laughs> um, but maybe we'll be 120 and then twice 60. That's the new standard. <laughs> but it's, a, it's really, it's, I think it, it's almost like the fascinating, you know, it's becoming for me like yoga as the dying process. Like, through abhyasa and vairagyam, you know, letting, letting it be. And it's fascinating. So that's that's the possibly the only good thing about old age. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, oh, Richard. <laughs>
to leave this practice into the daily practice. Um, so for me, someone who says that they're practicing with the Johnny Joyce method of yoga has to be practicing daily. Otherwise, they're practicing something else, which is fine. You don't have to be practicing this, but yeah, I don't think there's any leeway in there for taking days off in this practice. It just doesn't exist. There's no excuse whether you're tired or whatever. But again, you can do 15 minutes. I travel all the time. So did you not hear any of that? <laughs> so I travel a lot. I manage to practice when I travel. It may only be 15 minutes, yeah, but that's a practice. So for me, that maybe you should work 50 or 60 hours a week. <laughs>
few years that teachers coming back from Mysore do fewer and fewer adjustments. Is that a philosophy for Mysore, or are people really worried about strong adjustments? Yes, you asked yes, ask the wrong guy. I don't go to Mysore that much. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, recent years I went there, but I really can't comment on why people coming back from there don't make adjustments or where I, you know, I don't really know what to say. The system was built around adjustments, but Tommy Joyce, I, I think, well, I, I'll answer a speculation about it based upon no facts or anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's like channeling, which is the most brilliant career because no one can tell you you're wrong. <laughs> channeling stuff, so. But all of us up here can attest to the fact that in the early days, there were not many people. And Patabi Joyce had a lot of energy and enthusiasm. He adjusted a lot. He was right there on top of you almost every asana. He would just adjust you many, many times. Flash forward to today in Mysore, there's 300 people there. Of course, you're not going to get many adjustments there because there's a lot of people waiting to come into the room. I think it's just a practical a practicality that there's so many people, they don't have time to adjust. You'll get one or two adjustments maybe, and, and you're and they're on, you know, somebody else needs that space on the floor. So it might just be the fact that the sheer numbers of people, they don't have the time to adjust like they used to, and then that person perceives it as, wow, you, you shouldn't adjust so much, but that's not what I suspect, but I don't really know, I mean. <laughs> Therefore, 
the left foot, the right, which is good, should be on top of the band to keep the bad out of control. So the, the non-Buddhist, the um, one following, you know, the more close to the Vedic tradition of the belt, the right foot gets to go first because it's good. In the Buddhist tradition, the right foot goes on top or second because it's good. And so in um, Tantric Puja and Buddhism, whenever you're doing, you're worshiping the more horrific deities, and there are lots of them to that yeah. You know, with you're waging war on the next monastery. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, they'll sit in the right foot at first, but Masana, chant the mantras and shoot thunderbolts across the valley. But normally they'll sit with left foot up. You know, so if you notice statues of the Buddha, it's always the left foot up first. So the rationale is similar, but the two traditions very much mirror each other, and that whatever they do is completely backwards and wrong. So we'll do the opposite. Um, and then we have rationales. Well, the intestines on your, your right, you know, you have the ascending colon on the right side, and then it transverse. Then it comes the descending colon is on the left side. So the configuration of the feet will affect the flow in the colon. I don't know if any studies have been done. Um, but it's a great, it sounds good. So in other words, you get a lot of explanations that sound good. Um, I won't tell them about it. No. Jim. Okay. Can I tell you? Okay. I can tell you.
I was up to take the next class as I was waiting out the lobby for him to finish teaching the class. I hadn't seen him in about a year, and so I'm sitting in Padmasana, but I'm sitting with my right over my left. So Guruji comes out, and he sees me sitting like this, and rather than say, oh, team, so happy to see you. <laughs> he looks at me in my Padmasana and says, why are you sitting Padmasana incorrectly? <laughs> And so I tried to explain, you know, the situs and verses, the liver and the spleen. <laughs> he looked at me and said, this is not possible. <laughs> that was it. That was it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Does anybody out there have a desire to ask a burning question? That I was present for David Williams asking Guruji that question every day that we were there until Guruji finally got so annoyed with him that he told him to stop asking. So I can tell you what Guruji's answer was to him every day. We sit with our right foot up first, he said, because it will adversely affect our liver and spleen if we sit left foot up first. He said that energy in our bodies is meant to travel in one direction, and it's clockwise, what Richard was talking about. He also said that the reason we roll in Garbhapindasan clockwise is because this is the direction that babies travel in the womb. I've never had this verified, but <coughs> anyone that has had an MRI and knows it's impossible. So for me, I heard those explanations and I never questioned. I just sat right foot at first. But I know David, to this day, sits and reverses his legs. But definitely, now those were Guruji's explanations. Yeah, my question is, uh, how, we can, uh, how we can combine uh, the yoga practice with the corporate world? In the understanding that uh, we have a lot of of ego, we have a lot of attachment to many things, uh, my office, uh, my status, my, my promotion. How we can put these things together? What's your advice on that? Who are you asking? Any okay. Other okay. Does anybody want to answer that? Or are they <laughs> Two corporate guys walk into a bar. <laughs> One of them's got a gun on his head. <coughs> a friend of ours was, I was just telling this story earlier, a friend of ours was a big high court judge in New York City. Very powerful woman. And I was teaching her yoga lessons in her chambers. And so I would go there in the middle of the day and she would be in there meeting with all these big attorneys and things and when her assistant would say, you know, David's here, she would just boot them out of her office. She would say, you've got to go, it's time for my yoga. They would leave, I'd go in there, she's in her chambers, in her robes, she'd pick her robes up, she had yoga clothes on her <laughs> Right, so she just fit it into her day, and I don't know that it's really any different for a corporate person than it is for anyone else. You know, a corporate person, a person with family, you just fit it in where you can, you use it as a tool for your life. And yoga makes everything easier, and everything else makes yoga harder, but it's a tool. <laughs> it's becoming much more common for corporations to bring in yoga teachers and meditation teachers because they are making the uh, businesses uh, happier and healthier and more compassionate uh, arena. So um, the way to fit it in is just like David did, said, you know, just do it, just put it into the day, and it changes the tone of, um, of how you're approaching business and what is the, you know, what is the purpose of doing business, what is the purpose of, of, um, of uh, you know, developing or uh, collecting wealth, et cetera, et cetera, which most corporations are concerned with, how to um, gradually begin to accumulate wealth in a more dharmic or um, thoughtful type of a manner what to do with the wealth that we are accumulating. So um, the corporate world definitely could use um, you know, as much of this as necessary. 
Um, there's nothing necessarily wrong with working for a corporation or with making money or with accumulating wealth. Um, those things are needed. Um, and all of us can bring uh, attentiveness and thoughtfulness to whatever it is that we're doing, whether we're teaching yoga or working for, you know, the evil empire of Starbucks. So, so all of these, you know, all of these, it, it should go everywhere. You know, our yoga should go everywhere. And not, you know, practicing, but really the, the yoga part of the yoga should go everywhere. And that's how we'll, you know, pull all of our circles closer together in the world. Um, uh, some of the work that uh, we do in New York with this nonprofit we run teaching yoga in the schools, where the people who are on the board are all seriously big corporation people. One of the guys who's on our board is um, uh, one of the head creative directors of Citibank. He does yoga every single day, and, um, and it's good for him. It helps him with his employees. It helps him with the mission of the corporations. It's good. We should do it. All it's great, Jim. I don't have time to let these people ask any more questions, but I want to do now is I want to give the panel a chance to sum up their experience of this weekend, which I think is unbelievable. And I think we can start with Richard and then we um, thank you all. Um, because to see all of you, each one of you, uh, you're fascinating. <laughs> Interesting. And uh, your sincerity and your curiosity about yoga and your eagerness to learn uh, is, is kind of spilling out of you. And I'm, I'm impressed by that. I'm really inspired by that. I'm inspired by the fact that somebody's actually interested in this stuff. And uh, maybe I should look into it too. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's a, a lot of fun to, to be here with uh, these uh, great teachers um, because uh, they really put a lot into it. And so they all are coming out ways with uh, their insights, uh, which are fantastic and great gifts to the world. So I'm, I'm inspired. Thank you very much. And more.
more time than me and you know, given stretches in Mysore. And it didn't matter how long you were there. If you were there for one week or a month or three months or a year or three years, the day you came up to Patabi Joyce and said, Guruji, it's been great, but I'm going home tomorrow. You go like this. Whoa. Why are you going so soon? <laughs> they put on the saddest puppy dog face you've ever seen. And people go, oh, I'm so sorry, Richard. I'll change my flight. <laughs> you would have rearranged their lives and changed flights and do that two or three times until finally you come back to him. And you don't even want to make eye contact with you. Like, Virgie, it's been really great. Um, and I've, I've got a family. I have a, a life. And I really need to go home. And then he would do the most beautiful, amazing thing. And he would place his hands and this smile would beam from his face and he would say happy journeys. Yeah, so I think it was an incredible blessing and I wish that blessing to all of you and to all of us up here. And I don't know that people want to grab the microphone, but I'm just going to go really fast and thank everyone. <laughs>
and other countries as well. Uh, as I wrote in my blog last week, <laughs> those of you that followed Tuesdays with Tim G, you already heard this, but uh, I describe this as being like uh, a family reunion. And it's really been like that for me to see so many familiar faces and people that I've known for years and have come to workshops and retreats and teacher trainings. Can I say that? <laughs> uh, so it, it's been a real privilege, a real pleasure, and a lot of fun besides to do this. Um, it seemed to go really well. So, um, Jen and Deb and Carol, what do you say next year in New York? Sarvesa 